you. So as Sean mentioned, uh, the, the title of this is Minimizing the Wild Guesses. Notice that we're not eliminating them. Sorry. Um, we're still going to have some guesses, but we're going to try and do them, as, as Nathan just mentioned, we're going to have a scientific wild-ass guess instead of just a wild-ass guess. As we go through this now, if you have some questions and things, bring them up, but we'll have to kind of move along a little bit to, to cover through the material. At the end of the time, I think we've got a little bit of time at the end to answer other specific questions. What I want to do is now, here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about the business entities and real property, because there's some things you need to understand about that. Uh, the business entities with considerable machinery and equipment or personal property stuff. We're going to look at and talk about business appraisers, real estate appraisers and machinery equipment guys don't always see the world the same. In fact, they see it quite differently. And since I wear all three hats, I can switch back and forth and give you some perspective I think that maybe you won't otherwise hear on how these things fit together and how they should work together if you particularly end up in a job where you're working with a couple of the other types of appraisers. In other words, who's in charge and, and how does it work? We've got some real standard of value and premise of value issues that will come up and bite you in the ass if you're not careful. Um, and we're going to give you some examples and talk about it. Make sure that you, you clearly define and you understand and your client understands the same thing so you're on the same page with premise and standards of value. Because if you screw this up, or the appraiser that you're working with in either real estate, machinery, equipment, or whatever has a different view, you're going to have a problem. Your value is going to be wrong, and you're going to have a mess. So there's some real problems that you have to deal with. Highest and best use problems. This is not a real estate only concept. Machinery equipment guys understand that. BV guys don't often understand this. You've got some issues, and BV, we'll talk about a little bit, typically look at it in two flavors, ongo ongoing, concern or liquidation. Well, there's some other things that you need to, to sort of expand on that a little bit. And we'll deal some real-world problems and then have some questions. Okay, let's get started on the fun stuff now. Oops, I'll get this thing to go. It's not cooperating. Huh. It was working great, Larry. <laughs> Yeah, he's having an issue there too. <laughs> it frees up. Okay, there we go. All right, let's talk about, first of all, the business entities and real property. They come in a few flavors too. And you're all familiar with these, but we need to talk a little bit about them. Some of the things that I see BV guys often neglect or just don't think through very carefully. First one, the most common, we're going to see entities that lease real property from an independent third party. Okay, your typical lease, right? Do you always get a lease, a copy of the lease when you're doing a, a business valuation or at least a summary of it? You better. I'd like, I want to get a copy of that actual lease. In other words, what have you got? As you're building your, your income forecast, you got to know, you know, what kind of escalations are in this lease. Is the lease renewable? If it's not renewable, you may have a real problem. Um, good example. Uh, they're not as popular now because, you know, these regional malls don't exist as, you know, they haven't done that well. But the greatest example is you get in some of these regional malls, they'll have somebody in there that's been there for five years, they're just kicking butt, making good money, the business is making lots of money, but their lease expires in six months and they got a jewelry store that's going to pay ten cents a dollar more, so when their lease expires in six months, they're booting them out. And they're going to go have to go down the street somewhere and their sales are going to fall by. 50, 60 percent. So how do you value that? Well, you got to take that into consideration and look at it. Percentage rent. Again, this is a concept, uh, if some of you that may not be familiar with it, a lot of these leases will be a fixed rate, so like $1,000 a month, or 6 or 8 percent of sales, whichever is greater. Or a combination. Or it could be a combination. So you got to read the lease, no. And so you've got to deal with that the lease expense could be a lot higher than the actual base rent. So that's something you've got to take care of. And another biggie, is this lease transferable? Most leases are going to say that you can transfer it with, you know, with, you know, with the permission not to be unreasonably withheld. They don't always say that. Sometimes a landlord can say, no, I'm not going to allow a transfer. 
and this lease will not be transferred, so the business is not going to sell. And so what kind of value does the business have in that location? Mm, probably it's liquidation value. Or it's you know, going to have to deal with the moving cost and all those kind of issues. So the lease is important. Now, we've also got the next one. Entities that lease the real property from related parties. Okay, this is where mom and dad have got the business, and they have the um, screw them LLC real estate company owns the real estate. And they're leasing it to the, the business for either through the roof because they don't want to pay self-employment tax or some other whatever, depending on the motivations. Now, when you do that, the proper way to do it is what? You adjust it, the rent, whatever they're paying, to the market rent. Josh? And they value the business. So what choice? So you do the property managers? You do the well, that's our little question here, huh? How do you determine it? Who determines it? Can you, as a BV appraiser, conclude to market rent? What have you done if you do that? Appraisal. Yeah, and do you have a license to appraise real property? If you do that and they, somebody comes after you, you're going to get a nasty fine from the real estate department in the state in which you're doing this. And some of them can be significant. I mean, we're talking like serious fines. Um, so how do you do it? Yeah. In other words, you could talk to a property manager, but are you going to get market rent? We don't know. You're going to get a real estate appraiser to come in and do a market survey? Well, that would be the ideal way to do it, but you don't have a budget for that in a lot of cases. So what do you do? You, what I would suggest you do is you get a relationship with some real estate appraisers and call them and ask them, hey, can you give me an idea what the market rent is for this thing? And quote them. Now, have you stepped out of line? No. Is that market rent going to be exactly right? Well, no. It's going to be a wild guess that we've tried to minimize as best we can, and it's going to be reasonably close. So you get a couple of real estate appraisers or, or real estate brokers. That works fine, too. You get a real estate broker that's operating in this industry. I'm very comfortable with using them. Bill? Are you them on the line there? No, because a real, est well, real estate appraisers you would, except for the, what they're going to do. They're going to give you a range. They're going to say a commercial property like that, oh, or, or an office space like that, it's going to go for around, in that area, maybe $12 a foot, 10 to $12 a foot. And then if you're doing that, you get it maybe from a couple of guys, and you just average it. And you, I, in my report, I would put in here, uh, real estate appraiser X said this, Y said this, Z said this, I'm going with this. That'll cover you. You're okay. Brokers are probably easier than real estate appraisers because real estate appraisers typically have to do the work to support it and all that. If you call a real estate broker, they can just pull it out of their butt because they don't have those kind of requirement, reporting requirements. And if you have a commercial real estate appraiser that's working in, or industrial guy that's working in your kind of area, um, I'd feel very comfortable with the market rent that they gave you. And then you, so you adjust the lease to that rate and you value the business. Pretty straightforward, right? What about these now? We've got uh, entities that own this real estate directly. The company owns the property. It could be released, could be leased from an independent third guy. Same kind of issues, really, isn't it? This is like the manufacturing company that owns the plant. It could be leased if you can find some kind of a thing like that. You could do the same kind of thing. That's right. You have, to, you have to do that. Did you hear that? If you do adjust, in fact, let's back up for just a second. That's what the other thing that you follow through, where the entity owns it, the real estate. In other words, the company itself owns the real estate. The proper way to do that is you come up with a market rent, you value the operating entity, then you add the value of the, business, the building that you better have appraised, the net value, and you subtract any mortgage debt against it to come to your stock value. You also have to remember when you do that, what else do you have to pull out? The interest expense on the mortgage has to come out of there too. So in other words, you add back the interest expense on the mortgage, subtract the market rent. And then you add the value of the real property as it's appraised minus the mortgage to adjust it and actually come to your stock value. Yeah. So the way to do that is to determine the equity value of the corporation. That's what you would do for the equity value of the corporation. 
Uh, because in other words, the, the risk factors associated with the real estate are different than the risk factors to the business. The business operating as an operating entity, much higher risk. And so if you just, in other words, you use the real estate here and you just assume that they own it. Say they own it free and clear. And you value it and do all the methodologies, you're going you're gonna to come up with a number that's going to be much higher than it should be. Oh, I understand. If, if, if for example, or lower, rather. Say, for example, you've got this corporation that owns the real estate right here on the corner. Yep. You run a real estate appraisal plan, you say the real property is worth this amount. Mm -hmm. You then do your business valuation uh, with uh, market rent or without market rent. Right? You'd have to do it with market rent. Because you, you need to know the value of the operating entity with the real estate because it's already been valued. And then, so then you add the, combine those two to come up with the value of the stock. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's a little weird to think it through sometimes. Okay, then this other one is, is another one that's a problem. This is where you got a real estate essential to operations. It's an operating asset, really. And you can't rent it typically from somebody else. In other words, this is where you've got this messy, ugly thing that's kind of like a real property going concern, but you can't split it out. This would be like a food processing facility where they've got a really specialized real property. I mean, this is really for this specific purpose only, and you're not going to be able to split it out. It's a manufacturing business of some kind that, that's not in a typical shell that you could deal with. So how do you value that? Well, you have to value it as an operating entity. And you have to understand that the real estate here may have some wrinkles. You're going to have to investigate a few things. Question would be, could the real estate itself be sold for more significantly more than the operating asset? You've got to consider that liquidation possibility. In other words, this thing's been, say, it's been in a family's business now. Families own this thing for 65 years. Um, the whole area is built up around it. Um, they could knock this down and turn it into houses, make a couple hundred million dollars, and go away. Where the business is worth five million. So what, what's the highest and best use? You scrape that puppy. But what if you're valuing a minority interest? You can't force them to scrape that puppy. So what's the value? Well, I would go ahead and I would certainly discuss that <laughs> and mention those kind of things and say, hey, I, we can't force this. The minority interest really may be, you know, the $50,000 or whatever it might be. However, if the business were uh, sold and whatever, the minority interest is probably going to be worth, uh, you know, $15 million or whatever. I would probably include that, depending on the, the purpose and use of the thing. If you're doing it for estate taxes, you'd leave that out. <laughs> Then you die. there you go. <laughs> so or or can the real estate just be sold off and can the business be moved? It may be expensive and all, but you got to consider that. You've also got some fun things that come out of contamination issues when you're dealing with real property that have been around for a long time, particularly in any kind of manufacturing type of deal. You're getting these kind of issues. That contamination sometimes can be expensive enough to re you know to re remove and remediate and all that that it's worth four, five, ten times what the business is worth. And it's actually worse than that because it's a liability that is potentially going to be tagged to the owners usually, and it's not going to go away. They're going to have to, to take care of that, and they're, they're all going to go bankrupt or whatever. And there's lots and lots of examples of that happening. Also, when you're doing these kind of things, you've got to consider, which I see business appraisers forget all the time, some capacity issues. This is one kind of example I've seen where I love it. A company was, I did this years ago, was making horse traders. And they were working three shifts a day. Their equipment was held together with bubble gum and, you know, baling wire and everything else. And uh, the appraiser was forecasting a 30% increase in sales. I mean, they were, they were maxed out at capacity. And I was going like, uh, how are they going to do this? They're going to have to move to a new facility, buy all new equipment, all those kind of things. Um, that's going to be a slight capital expenditure that wasn't dealt with in the report. And the time to transition, all those kind of things. In other words, think about it. That's the reason a lot of you, the reason the BV guys need to make a site visit to these kind of things is to look and see what's going on. How does it look? And to talk to management and say, what's really going on? Is it possible to incre increase capacity? 
Now, most of the time, they're running two shifts, maybe, and they can add a third, or the, you know, there's some, and they really do have some capacity issues, but not all the time. And then my favorite, this is my specialty, where we deal with, I call them real property going concerns. Real estate guys still call them going, going concerns, which um, drives the BV people nuts because they're talking about, that's a business concept. Um, what they're talking about, and the reason I call them real property going concerns, is it's a kind of an entity where you can't really split out the real estate and the business and machinery and equipment. It's all one big conglomerate mess. Examples of that would be like, you know, assisted living facility, auto dealerships, bowling centers, coin-operated self-car washes, those kind of things. Fast food restaurants. Now, those are a little bit different because you can usually split them out, but fast food restaurants, what I'm talking about, this would be something like where the, you know, the typical restaurant where um, a Sonic burger, you know, nobody else is going to be able to use that as a restaurant because it's, you know, it's, it's so specifically designed for their use only. Ron. Self-storage Self is another one like that. Golf courses, all those kind of things. In fact, there's, this list goes on. Um, all these kind of things. Now, as a BV guy, when you, like, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want you to do this, do a mobile home park, can you do it? Not without a real estate appraiser. You're going to have to have a real estate appraiser help you. Now, on the other side, uh, from a real estate appraisers, they all look at this and say, oh, we can do all those. No problem. And I've seen them screw those up royally for most of them. Now, a real estate appraiser, can they do a hotel? Sometimes. And then they've got a lot of data to support them. Th most of them, they can do a pretty decent job on a hotel. Uh, there's two, in the appraisal institute, there's two main groups. There's a Rushmore group and a uh, David Lanham group that do not get along. In fact, they hate each other. And they both look at it as completely different ways of getting there. And it's fun to watch them. And I think they're both wrong. Yeah, were they a real estate appraiser? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I mean, they, they yeah. Were yeah. So I, I understand Golf courses are, are a special problem. Let me talk about that for a minute, and then we'll ask another question. Because in many instances, the value of the land is so high, they don't pencil. Yeah. In fact, they're, as an operating entity, they make no sense at all. That's very common. In fact, I would say 95% of golf courses are probably in that game. Why were they built? They were built to sell houses, usually. And so they're operated for whatever, or they're, you know, for whatever purpose, or they're a municipal alley. But as a privately owned golf course, they usually make no sense at all. You just have to understand it. And you have to have somebody that knows how to value the, as what? Value in use as a golf course. Because the highest and best use is not going to be continued use as a golf course almost without fail. So if you're going to value one of these things, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, a little bit later. You're going to be valuing not market value, not fair market value. You're going to be valuing market value or fair market value in use as a golf course with all these other weird things. Now, if you get asked to do that, you're going to have to find a real estate appraiser that's competent to do the real estate, and then you can do the business part. What's he, what do you need from the real estate appraiser? You need the market lease rate. What could the golf course real property be leased for so you can put it into your business value as an expense. If you can't get that, you can't do your job. Yeah. Yes. That's right. 
Uh huh. Uh, Yep. That's right. You have to get three people together. Yep. Three people. Usually, you try as a BD guy to be in control. Yeah. Uh, oh, I know. BV guys are always control freaks. <laughs> that won't come as a surprise to any, any guys, will it? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And they would say, do you need a room? And they'd go, events, you know, uh, corporate events and things like that. Yeah. And they'd be entertaining. Mm -hmm. So the problem that, was, that I had, you know, with appraising the business with the real estate, yeah. no problem, is it's the income coming from rent, food, yeah. real estate, yep. all this stuff. So I, I went to New York and talked to a couple of MAIs that were used to value in yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's what we did. And mm -hmm. brought it back. And, and, you know, remember the story I made about you trying to separate the rationale for it. Okay. But the fact is that you had to have appraisal knowledge, business valuation, and there was some equipment, specialized equipment in there. In those theaters, yep. Oh, yeah. So these are these are really challenging and interesting projects. Do you see that as an opportunity for, for business valuation people to have cooperation with you have to find an MEI that, that's one, that doesn't think he knows everything. Right. Um, that's hard to do because as an MEI, I can say we, we do know everything. Um, so most MEIs, or well, not really, there's a lot of MEIs that think they can do this stuff. And they really screw them up royally. Uh, and I have a number of them that will come to me and say, hey, how do I do this? And I'll help them with it. Um, but these are tough. And there's one of the guys for the appraisal institute who wrote a, a book on how to do gas stations at sea stores. He's considered the industry expert. He commits mal tells you to commit malpractice in that thing at least a dozen times. And I've sat down and talked with him. I know him well and, and said, hey, you're wrong here. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, no, 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 no. And I said, yeah, here's why. Boom, 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 boom. And we just disagreed. And, of course, as we know, BV appraisers, that's part of the game. We often disagree. Yeah. That's right. Not from the financial statement. Then you need the yeah, That's right. And that's really the, the way to put it. I think that's the most accurate way to put it. So anyway, the simple RP, or what I call the real property going concerns, you have to be a real estate appraiser to do those. And a lot of these, they can, do, they can get by. This next little list, they have to have a BV guy. And they're probably going to have to have an M&E guy. Because... There's just no, these are businesses that happen to be integrally smeshed with the real estate, and you just can't pull them apart very easily. <coughs> Amusement park, can you think you can do that as a real estate guy? No. Can you do it as a BV guy? No. Because it's real estate. You've got to have both. And you're probably going to need an M&E guy before all the other weird stuff in there. So, Nathan, you said you've had some weird deals. How would you like to do some ride on Disneyland? That'd be kind of fun, huh? Have you? Um, these larger assisted living facilities and things, convention centers. I've done a number of convention centers. It's not just a hotel. You've got a restaurant and often all kinds of other stuff in there too. It's a business. And you can't do them the way the MEI typically does a, uh, a hotel because they figure like the business value, one of the groups says we can figure that business value is just 5%. 5% of the revenue, essentially the flag cost. That's it. That's the BV value. No, it's not. It depends on, I mean, if it's making, could make big bucks. It could be losing its butt. There's some management aspects and things in there that you've got to deal with. <coughs> now I've talked a little bit about the food processing facilities. Those are really interesting because where does the machinery and equipment start and begin? Is the freezer that's the, you know, the, the 50,000 square foot freezer, is that machinery and equipment or is that real property? Uh, is the, the lines that they run all over the place to 
put uh, compressed air and uh, nitrogen gas and all that kind of stuff. Are those lines machinery equipment? They're mounted on the surface. Are they a fixture? Are they personal property? Are they what are they? And you get into all kinds of interesting arguments and all kinds of all the you know the machinery now. A lot of that is seriously attached. I mean, like embedded into the concrete and all this other kind of stuff. How much of that is real property? How much of it is machinery equipment? Okay. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more when we get to this. Uh, what's the standard of value we're using? What's the premise of value? That's going to have a big impact on what's going to go on here. <coughs> Truck stops. Again, those kind of things, they're all three things. And there's a lot of others. So typically, now, and then any, any entity without any real property at all, those, those are the BV guys have at it. All your intangible valuations and you know the 409As and all that kind of stuff. Clear cut, nobody's going to argue, you got it. Now, here we go with some fun ones now where you've got, now we've got a business entity with a lot of machinery and equipment. What are we going to do with these things? Okay, you've got an equipment rental or leasing company. I mean, you've got substantial amount of personal property in these things. Can you as a BV guy just use the operating income method only and feel comfortable? You've got some market data. But how are you going to do the value of the, you're going to have to have a, probably have an m and &E guy come out and tell you what the world of equipment is. And you're going to have to explain to them what standard of value you want them to use. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Because it's going to have a major impact. Heavy equipment construction company. I've done a bunch of those. Where they've got, you know, gazillions of dollars tied up in bulldozers and scrapers and all kinds of stuff. Machine shops, you're doing the business valuation of something like that. You need to know how much that machine and equipment's worth. Oh, yeah. Last year I worked on a, a construction trailer area, and they were spending kind of a fortune in there. So it was really old tires and worn out stuff. I think mm -hmm. it was about four years old, maybe five years old. I spent the same thing over and over again. It's where do you where do you I did not. So where do you draw the line as far as the degree of machinery and equipment trades? And the other assumption you gave was it's just part of your normal operating um, you know, equipment. It goes long, normally. Yep. It's, it's, I, I find that kind of it's confusing. Well, the next couple slides are going to lead right into that. It was <laughs> great. <laughs> People you will think that I paid you to ask the questions. Huh? So in other words, when we're dealing with these kind of things, we're, you know, the BV guy's got to figure out how significant it is. Just like I said, does it need to be valued? Because it's expensive to have an M&E appraisal done. Now, depending on the nature of the, what your assignment is and how big the deal is and all that kind of stuff, it's going to sort of drive this, isn't it? It's time consuming and it's expensive. Sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's not. So my suggestion is, and, and this is what I actually do in virtually any, uh, every single business appraisal I do, that's got any kind of machinery equipment, I do in a cost approach on that machinery equipment. And let me explain how it's done. Now, there's some things that you need to know about this. The cost approach is lovingly called trend and bend. Because there's some real assumptions you're going to make of this. In other words, I would never ever do a cost approach only, unless there was no other choice, and say this was a machinery and equipment appraisal. Because there are some, remember we were talking about ways to minimize the wags? This is a wag. Clear cut, the cost approach is a wag. It's a scientific wag, and you're going to get narrow things down, but it's still a wag. And as I talk through the example here a little bit, I'm going to point out some of the risks and things that you need to be aware of when you do this. But what it does do is it solves your, as a business appraiser, under USPAP, you are required to consider Liquidation. <coughs> you must consider, is liquidation the highest and best use? Standard nine. It tells you that flat out. You've got to consider it. Here's how you do it. Okay. You get the depreciation schedule, the most recent depreciation schedule. Now, there's a lot of problems with that because the biggest problem you're going to have is some stuff may be on that depreciation schedule, but they got rid of it 15 years ago. It's still on there. 
So you, I sit down with management and I ask them to go through it. And I ask them, okay, how much of this stuff is no longer here? Is there any of that stuff? I try and eliminate that. And then what we're going to do is, this is from a real deal. You take each item, you've got the date acquired, you try and get the year manufactured if it's a significant item. You, th that's not on the appreciation schedule. But that, you, if you have to do, you may just have to use the date acquired. But I want to know both if I can. And on a large deal like this, I, you're able to get some of those. The reason you need to know that is you're going to then you're going to build you've got the historical cost what they paid for it. So far no problem, right? Then we need to do is we need to come up with what is the reproduction cost or replacement cost new? Really technically I should have said replacement cost new. What is that what would it cost now? And the way you typically do that the correct way to do it now, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to tell you the way I do it on these things. The correct way is you go out to like the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you get the cost appreciation for the last however many years for that specific industry. And you pull that in and you do the, but on a, on a small BV, I'm just not going to do that. When I'm doing a machine equipment thing and I'm using a cost approach as a check, I do that. But on a, on a BV thing, I'm going to use two or two and a half percent a year, typical inflation rate. And I'm going to say, OK, how old was it? It's four years old, so I'm going to take my historical cost and I'm going to mark it up 4% compounded. I mean, 2% for four years. So that's my replacement reproduction cost or replacement cost new. Then you have to make a decision on its effective age. OK, that's a little bit more of a push. But you can tell on a lot of these things. And so what I'm on. Well, let me show you the next slide here. We really need, how long is it going to be? How long is it going to last? Your remaining useful life. This useful life is the critical component. How often do they typically replace these things? Now, if you don't know, you can ask management. You can get, ask Paul to have you send you uh, ASAs typical equipment useful life, which I'll be happy to send you. They've got a list of all kinds of stuff and the typical useful life for these different kinds of assets. And if you send me an email, I'll send you that. IRS hmm? The IRS yeah. life. Uh, their life. Yeah, they consider their life. Their yeah. Life. yeah. yeah. Um, but I want a more of a market life. Uh, Marshall and Swift, Marshall Valuation Services, a real estate guys, uh, have all the real estate appraisers have it. They've got a section in there also, which gives you typical useful lives for a lot of equipment. Or if it's a big enough deal, a big enough piece of equipment, I'll call some machinery and equipment brokers who sell this stuff and say, how often does it, do the people replace these? <coughs> yeah, Ron? I always ask for the repair record. Yeah. If you really want to get into it, yeah. If it's a major piece and you're doing an equipment appraisal, then I would. But if for a BV thing, I wouldn't do that. Okay. It's just too much work. We're trying to get close. So what you're basically going to do is you're going to get a useful life, essentially the remaining useful life, and I just straight line it. What's the depreciation? And then I've got my remaining or my replacement cost minus the depreciation. Here's what it's going to be probably worth with the factor that you've got to consider depending on the industry. I'm going to come in and say some kind of a percentage, 5 or 10%, probably minimum value. In other words, guys have still got something that's 15 or 20 years old. They're still using it. It's still got some value. So I'm going to say it's worth 5 or 10% of what the, origin, of the replacement cost new is. Then I'll run all those up, and here we go. So here's what I did. Here's, this is actually the value factors here. This is where I, for, I used the ba Bureau of Labor Statistics for this particular type of equipment, and I pulled that in. I used that. I didn't use a 2% a year. I should have put the 2% a year thing in here. Nathan? What, pardon? That's always a tough one. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so you'd be close, depending on the industry, too. On this, what it does, yeah. So I would have been within a reasonable amount, right? I mean, at least in the soft Yeah, you could do that. But for, again, where you're trying to consider this, particularly if you're going to go into any kind of a litigation, you need to have a little bit more support than I think just that. I would agree, but I'm, at that point, you're going with what is the engagement of the industry. 
Yeah, that's right. And you can do that too. But with this kind of thing, and you come up with a number, here are, I'm saying the equipment on this one was worth 715. What was it? Cost, uh, historical cost, a million six. But see, but Nathan, also what we're going to do is I'm typically going to use an excess earnings approach method with this, and I'm going to rely on the value of the equipment. So I want to have a little bit more to hang my hat on than just a rule of thumb type thing. That's the reason I do this. Yeah, I do. But for somebody who doesn't. But could you you guys could all do this? Couldn't you do that? No, I, I have an answer that's going to be yes. Okay. Yeah. But people who are just going to be Yeah. How much uh, how do you how does somebody from experience determine the accessibility? Yeah, that's where you're going to have to look it up or talk or whatever. Well, you can't yeah. Look it up. No, you have to look at the equipment. In this case, you're typically not, you're going to have gone through and seen the overall equipment, but you're not going to look at each and every piece because you're not doing an equipment appraisal. So, in other words, is it perfect? No. It's got some issues and problems, but it's going to get you in the neighborhood. In other words, you're going to be able to say liquidation is a op serious option or no, this is, should be valued as a going concern. That's what I'm trying to say. Paul, real quick. Yeah. Uh, for people like myself in the business, I'm sure it's self is the same. Yeah. To, for, for initial screening, it would be if you're going to hang your hat on things and, and need it for a specific, like for IRS purposes, get a machinery and equipment appraisal. You know, yeah, if you're just listed it and that kind of thing, yeah, this would be fine. Want to know what the FF &E is. This would get you in the ballpark. Okay, and it's affordable? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Has it got wrinkles? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Then he found out that I could do equipment. Mm -hmm. So there's another $5 million worth of equipment out there. The broker, the auctioneer, walked through the plant mm -hmm. and came up with a total value of $8 million. It took me a month to, to do it this way, and we were $20,000 off in the bag <laughs> for him walking through just put, uh, based on his experience uh -huh. doing that, but something similar. And the other thing, the Japanese company that owned this, they had all the maintenance records. They had all yeah. the costs and everything yeah. prorated, prorated all the way over. So yeah. it was easy to determine what that. And that a deal on that was. size, you know, it makes sense to do the machinery equipment appraisal. Yeah, and get it done and get it right. What I'm talking for a BV guy, though, to do something simple like this, in fact, this is not as good as examples. I could send you a better example that's just a straightforward without the other things. So if you ask for it, I'll send you a, a simpler one on just a, how to do it with just a straight percentage markup. Yeah, Bill? The issue that I usually run into is overall materiality. Yeah. A lot of what I see is partnerships where they're putting in $10 million, or there's $10 million worth of land and $250,000 worth of equipment. Yeah, in that case, it doesn't matter. And it, right. It, in that way, I'm doing something like this real quick, and I'm adjusting uh -huh. the amount of depreciation based on yeah. an estimate of the actual. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. So this is just a tool that you can use, but you need to be aware of, now there's some problems here. You don't know the how what kind of condition this equipment's in, really. You don't know if they bought it new or they bought it used. That's why I try and find the year. If you knew the year of manufacture, then you'd know. But you're, um, this is not going to be on the depreciation schedule, so you're not going to know. So that would be a big difference. And you've yeah. also got massive issues in the effective age based on, like for instance, let's say that new Holland tractor you know, yeah. up from the bottom. Yeah. Here in California, throw it away. Yeah. You better sell it to Nevada. Right. So yeah, and you've got all kinds of issues like that. But what this is designed to do is to give you a way with some support to say ongoing concern makes sense. We're going to value this as an ongoing concern. Or, no, we're going to recommend they pull the plug and they sell this stuff off and liquidate it. That's what it's for. And then I also will use this as my, in my excess earnings method. Uh, back here. I love the excess earnings method. I'm probably one of the few BV guys in the world that like it. Um, you know, because the IRS is, everybody else has poo-pooed on it for years. I like it. And it's still used by people that are doing intangible asset values all the time. I like it because it gets, 
another approach that I feel comfortable will help support or at least let me know if there's something screwy. Particularly if you've got something with heavy assets. And what I will do on it is, um, you'll see up here, I go through and I'll just pull out my major asset categories. I've got the percentage of the total assets and I'm going to come up with another WAG. What's my estimated rate of return for that category of assets? And there's a lot of, I've heard lots and lots of arguments and, and things, you know, what can you borrow against it and this and that and all kinds of rates. I basically have come up with another, you know, the cash you're going to get, you know, well, in good years, you're going to get 2% on it. You're not, you maybe get back to 2% again. But, uh, you know, accounts receivable, maybe, you know, eight, inventory around 10. Now, are these numbers hard and fast? No. They're a guess. You know as you come down this, the, the return should be higher. So some kind of like that. And I've just done a weighted return, and I'm just going to say that's my return on tangible assets. So would the banks perhaps be a good source on that? No. no. There is no good source. Okay. Then on my rate of return on intangible assets, Sean and I wrote an article a gazillion <coughs> years ago about how we do that. Hmm? Was it 2003? <laughs> huh? <laughs> and, and we came up with this little formula that basically helps tweak the intangible value asset return. You know, is it perfect? No, but it's, it was better than anything else that had been out there. And I haven't seen anybody else come out with something better. Yeah. And so it works. It, it actually gives you something that you can support. We know that by definition, the rate of return on intangible assets has got to be higher than the tangible, and it's got to be higher than your overall discount rate. So that gives you a way to do it. Then I throw it into my excess earnings method, boom, come up with a value. And I use that then as another method. Now, do, am I going to ever give 100% value to this? No, never. But I'm going to use it to support my overall methods. I used it not too long ago. We had a client that had four restaurants. Yeah. And Ah, yeah. And I use it Good. Value. Yeah, makes sense, doesn't it? All right, now let's talk about how people, uh, different appraiser groups, look at things. And this is something that's really, really important to understand. BV guys, now we know this. BV guys are most often valuing equity. Once in a great while, you get value, value assets that will normally transfer in a sale, like for an SBA loan. But almost never do you value asset. You, your value in the equity, probably what, 95% of the time? It's very common to value less than 100% interests for estate gift and other transfers or whatever. So business appraisers do this all the time. Most commonly, or most concerned with cash flow and after tax cash stream. Real estate guys never deal with taxes. It's com they commonly analyze financial statements and income tax returns all the time. So business appraisers are very good at that. They know exactly how to analyze them, normalize them, and do all those kinds of things. They struggle, though, to find market data very similar to the subject. Got some databases out there that give you some sales data for things that are kind of similar some of the time. And we make some interpolations and we make some adjustments or whatever. We may use the average or median of a sale, a bunch of these things, and say it's worth whatever. Real estate appraisers, when they see the way we do our market approach, are horrified. Machine and equipment appraisers probably too. Because uh, this would be like uh, machine and equipment appraisers using like uh, machine repeats and saying that's, 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 that's good enough. Or I'm going to just take all those for uh, this. We're going to average them and, or median and that's our number. Would that make you feel real warm and fuzzy? <coughs> that's what we do. That's, but that's the best data we got. Or we'll go off and we'll do maybe a guideline company approach where we'll use the data from a number of publicly traded guideline companies, which are not similar to a private company in any respect whatsoever, but other than they sell the same stuff. And we're going to make all kinds of assumptions about them. And we're going to say, even though they have direct capital market access and they've got all this kind of stuff, uh, we really are, can make some assumptions and say this is how they apply. I use the method periodically because IRS loves it. Um, I never feel really, really warm and fuzzy about it, but it does work on a big enough company. And besides, it gives me a reason to charge a lot more money because it takes a lot of time to do it. Uh, BV appraisal met methodologies and things are much more complex than you're going to find in the, in the real estate world or the machinery and equipment world. And 
there's lots more disagreement about them. I mean, business appraisers disagree about everything. Not just a few things, no, we don't. everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking for that, wasn't I? <laughs> now, cost to reproduce or an asset type approach may require these other kinds of appraisals. And then the selection of a capitalization or a discount rate is also very, very subjective. Again, real estate appraisers, they go out and they go with this wonderful market data. They've got 15 or 20 sales of very similar things, and they can extract that cap rate out of the, the market, and they feel very comfortable. Uh, business appraisers, you can't do that. Question, Yeah. Can we, uh, so how do you, when you create your company-specific risk premium, because uh -huh. that's always the challenging part of this. Well, every piece is, but yeah. Uh, that's the most challenging. That's probably the most challenging. Um, tell me how you uh, create the like you, I spent time in food and beverage. You say you're going to value maybe a, a, a three-unit, four- or five-unit restaurant chain. And tell me how you would move forward on valuing the company-specific risk premium. And I'm only bringing that out as an example. Oh, well, we don't have time to really get into the details of it, but well, I, I use I, I break it into like seven little factors, like the the economy and the industry and the okay. financial strength of the company, how the, you know how they compare to the industry and and their management, the depth, and uh, there's a number of factors, and I can give you those later. But yeah, I do that kind of a thing, and, and so th and talk about that. So I, that way, I've got like I usually use seven bullet points, sometimes a little seven. bit more, and I'm also going to talk about like customer concentrations in there and things sure. like that. Sure. Anyway, real estate appraisers, now here's how they look at it. They're almost always giving you an asset value. Almost never equity. They don't deal with the debt. They're looking at it as an asset. That's it. They almost never do less than 100% interest. You ask a real estate appraiser to do an undivided interest in real property, they freak out. That's a BV concept. They'll give you the value of the 100%, but they're not going to do a 3% a interest in this thing. Not going to happen. Or if they are going to do the 3% thing, run, because it's going to be scary. Um, they're most concerned with net operating income. This is a pre-tax income stream. They ignore the implications of income taxes when they're valuing these things. There's no income tax benefit or cost. It's net operating income. They typically have very simple, simplistic financial analysis and they don't know a thing about tax returns. They couldn't find their way through a tax return and get the stuff out of the other than they could pull like a Schedule E out of a personal return and get the income and the expenses associated with the property. But you go into a partnership return and ask them to come out and show you how to, you know, tell me about Schedule K and how that works. You lost them. They're gone. They generally have market data that's very similar to their subject, though. And they may have a lot of it. So they, and they know a lot about it. Their appraisal methodology has been around for 350 years. And it's all well established. Pretty much, there's not as many areas of w over which they fight. There's a few. Um, and I participate in those fights and have a great time. Um, but there are very few compared to like BV, where there's lots of them. And machinery equipment, there's sort of in between. There's a medium amount. The cost to reproduce, they've got really good data too. They've got Marshall and Swift and other sources like that where they've got stuff that's probably, what, several hundred thousand pieces of equipment or, or a property coming in. And they've got really, really good supportable data. And they can often extract this cap rate from the market or at least have some other ways to do it too. Machinery equipment guys, they almost always give you an asset value. Very seldom asked to do it, you know, something of equity. They rarely do less than 100%. They rarely use an income approach. Or when they do it, it's usually really simplistic and not very well supported. Because they're not BV guys. They don't understand how to do the overall business. And I'm always usually interested in seeing a, a, a machine equipment guy that's going to come in and say, I'm going to do the fair market value in continued use. Those are tough. And in order to really do them, I personally think you have to do a business appraisal and then allocate it. But it's tough. They most often rely on the sales comparison, which they often have really good data. And the, the cost approach, you'll see, they'll they use as a means of last resort, typically, or s additional support. Or if, if there's simply not enough any market data, or where they've got something where it's a unique item. And that's the only way you can do it, is basically to build up the cost of what it costs to reproduce it. 
something like that too. All right, here's the fun area now. And this is one that's really where we can get into trouble. The premise of value, you need to really be understand this stuff. Business value, business appraisers typically are going to use fair market value for probably 90% of the deals they're doing. Some of the time, especially uh, you get into fair value or some other defined value for the guys that are doing financial transaction types or financial statement stuff. Guys that are doing public companies and things like Ron probably does that kind of nonsense. Um, very complex, ugly stuff, and there's all kinds of rules that you got to follow. And uh, unless you're a CPA and have a lot of background in that, don't mess in that area. It's really a mess. Let Ron do them. Um, he's welcome to them. <laughs> and the premise of value is usually going concern, which is assumed that's what's going to be, but it's sometimes it's a liquidation. Now, real estate appraisers, this is an area where we get into some problems. Most of the time they're going to use market value, which is kind of a semi-similar definition to fair market value. Some real estate stuff, particularly if you're doing eminent, I mean, you're doing a eminent domain and or property tax appeals, the definition is fair market value. But it doesn't really tell you what it is. It's, you get, it gets ugly. And occasionally they're going to try and use value and use or the value of a going concern. And, but as I say here, and I'm, I tick off all the real estate appraisers, most of them have no idea how to do those because they're, they're weird. And the premise of value now it can, be, it can be as is, as completed, at stabilization, or has gone dark. And let me give you another example, talk about this for a couple minutes, because this is really important to understand. This is an area now that th there's a still a big fight going on and has been for a number of years in the real estate world. What do you do with a property that's gone dark? In other words, we're talking about the big box store where the box, big box occupant has departed. And it's still sitting there. What's it worth? Well, it was worth a lot to Costco when they were running it and running a Costco there. And if you had Costco, it's probably still worth a lot because they're going to pay the rent, even though it's sitting there vacant. But uh, there's a bunch of others. I mean, what's it used? What's it worth to the secondary user? A whole lot less. Now, here's the argument. And this is the one I'm going to use when I talk uh, in July to the Appraisal Institute group. Let's suppose, and there's a good example, there's a Porsche auto dealership build a brand new, incredible facility. Cost them four million bucks. Included in this facility, though, are a bunch of stuff, improvements that are really brand specific to a Porsche. Such they went out and had it checked to see if some other dealer were to buy their building, would they pay for it? No, they would pay three million dollars for it instead of four million. $4 million is the value to the Porsche dealer. $3 million is the value to the, the Buick dealer. What's market value of that building? Well, another dealer would pay $3 million. Does that make it, for mar does that make it market value? Okay. But what if somebody were to buy the Porsche dealer? Buy that dealership, the business. What's the fair market value, or the, what's the market value of the real property? $4 million. The market value of that property cannot be worth more than its replacement cost new. Can't be worth more than what it costs to replace it. So that's a, a $4 million cost. It can't be worth more than that. Anything more than that is an intangible asset attributable to the business. Hmm? Right, to the new, to the de as it was built for the Porsche dealer. If they moved out, then it's probably worth $3 million because it has functional obsolescence. Or somebody else. Then it might be worth less. So when you're talking about that, now if you're going in and you're arguing about this and say, okay, what's the purpose of our appraisal? That's what really is going to drive things, isn't it? Now if you're valuing the Porsche dealership as an operating ongoing business, it might be worth, what, 15 or 20 million. Who knows? We don't have all the details. But let's say it's worth $10 million. And we would allocate that out. We would allocate $4 million to the real property. 
And what would we call that? I would call it the market value of the real property in use. And a, a guy's written a, Kerry Jorgensen, an MAI, who I know, good guy, has written an article which was published and, and, and stirred up all kinds of problems. He's a big muckety-muck in the Appraisal Institute. And most of the Appraisal Institute guys are going, oh, no, he can't have that. But that's what it is. It's market value and use. Yes. That's right. So you're looking at it, and you got it. So you're talking about that now. You, as a business appraiser, if you're appraising that Porsche dealership, you got to explain to the real estate guy what you need. Otherwise, what are they typically going to do? They're going to value it as if it's dark, and it's going to be offered to the next user. In other words, what would the real estate sell for vacant to somebody else? Is that of use to you as a business appraiser? If you're liquidating, but if you're valuing operating business, no. Not at all. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where you're, you've built up, you've got to build the, this big retail center. And it's now, the construction's all done, there's no tenants. And so you start filling it up. And when it's all full and generating full income, that's at stabilization. It's now stabilized. That's what they're talking about. So that's a future time, so it's, it hasn't happened yet. So that's what real estate appraisers, that's how they, they view the world. Okay, now the machinery equipment. We'll see some of these guys, machinery equipment guys in here will straighten me out if I'm wrong. Huh? There's a bunch of different standards of value in machinery equipment thing. This is something that you, when I started, first got into the machinery equipment thing and I looked at this, I thought, yeah, this makes the BV thing make more sense. I'm going, yeah, now why doesn't BV have to do this? We got, under fair market value, it comes in a variety of flavors. You can have fair market value removed. In other words, what's the fair market value of this piece of machinery if it's pulled out of there and sold to somebody else somewhere else? Okay, in other words, the value of it yanked. What's the fair market value of it continued use with assumed earnings? This is an ASA definition. So they're saying, assuming the earnings are in place to support the value of the equipment being there. So that's typically what it's, what's it going to be. It's the equipment, the cost to get it, to buy it, the cost to get it there, to install it, get it up and running, and all that kind of stuff. Everything that's associated with it. That's the fair market value, they would call it, in continued use. With assumed earnings. In other words, the earnings are there to support it. Is that right? Is that how you view it? Nathan? Okay. Well, then you've also got fair market value. Okay. That's, it's an ASA concept, so this is so okay. So fair market value, continued use with an earnings analysis, and in other words, where you go actually do the whole analysis to show that it's in place, that it's there. Again, to do that, you really got to be a BV guy. Yeah, it's again, it's, it's the definition of whatever you and the client agree to. Oh, right. In other words, but you're trying to see, I'm trying to show with some of these, and there are a bunch more. There's just fair market value and continued use without saying anything else about it. But essentially, when you're saying fair market value and continued use, if you don't further clarify it, it's vague and you don't know. Or you, have to, you have to assume that the earnings are there to support it, or continued use wouldn't work. Yeah. Well, and you're not trained to, to figure out. You're not trained to figure it out. But what you're really doing, you're saying that you're assuming the earnings are there to support it. Or it wouldn't be in continued use. Well, yeah, it's the assumption that it's in continued use. Yeah, and right, and that's what you have to. That, but so that's what their ASA is going on a little further and, and trying to nail that down. Michelle, you, you run an and so it, what you're doing then with the actual earnings analysis means you hired a BV guy to make sure the thing. That's right. Yep. And so the reason I'm pointing this out is I want you to be aware of that. And then, of course, you've got like just fair market value installed. Okay. That's the cost of bringing it there, buying it, sticking it there, and hooking it all up and getting it all set. That's different than fair market value removed, isn't it? By a, could be a large amount. 
or like Nathan talked about an example of uh, what was the, the equipment you were talking about that they had a negative value of a million five because it would cost more to get it out than it was. Yeah. So, I mean, you can have some of those things that are backwards. So you as a BV guy need to understand there could be some real variation depending on what you need. And then on the liquidation side, you've got several flavors here too. Orderly liquidation means what? You got to sell it, but you got sufficient time to market it and get it well, you know, exposed, and you're going to get the best price you can get. Kind of an auction. This is an this is an auction type thing is the way I look at it. Forced liquidation is you got to sell it, and it's got to be gone tomorrow. You know, like really quick. This is the fire sale. It's going to be some kind of discount off of the order liquidation. How much is it discount? Well, it depends on how you're defining forced liquidation. How fast do you have to get rid of it? And typically, on a forced liquidation, you don't, you don't have time to advertise it really well either. So there's some, there's some problems. And I don't think there's really good data here to support forced liquidation. Again, it comes down to somebody's, really, the equipment appraiser's opinion based on talking to some people that sell this stuff. And you know, what are you going to likely get? If you did this, this stuff in orderly liquidation, you're going to get x. If you did it in a forced liquidation, you're going to get x times whatever percentage of a discount. How much is going to discount? 30 40% or you know, whatever it is. And that's kind of how you do it. Or there's liquidation value in place. In other words, we're going to sell it here. The guy that buys it has to come and pull it out. Different number. And there are a mess of other ones. Yeah, or, or anybody else. You can make up a new one, too, depending on what the client wants. Yeah. It, and, and so you, when you're doing an equipment thing, when you, the ABV guy, go to the equipment appraiser, you got to make sure that you understand which one he's going to do. Because if you're doing a an ongoing business, and you say, machinery equipment guy, hey, give me a value, he's probably going to give you orderly liquidation, because that's the easiest one to do. A BV guy is going to probably give you orderly liquidation value, unless you tell him otherwise. I mean, a machinery equipment guy. You, the BV guy, are going to say, I want the machinery equipment appraised, but you don't tell him which one. Which one are you going to pick, Nathan? Usually it's fair market value. Yeah. Fair market value removed? No, just fair market value. Okay. And uh, is that in place or not? In use. In use. <laughs> You're assuming it's a continued use. And that's what you'd want. OK. And as a, as a BV guy, that's what I'd want. And the reason for that is because that's the Yeah. But if you used all your data, only got all your data from like auctions, what, would that be fair market value and continued use? And construction equipment could be. If it's a manufacturing line, probably not. Because that's going to, well, that's not going to include your, all your installation and all those costs, typically. Yeah. So if you're adding the continued use, then the, the machine equipment appraiser is going to have to figure all that out, and you're going to get a number that's going to work for you. You got, you got to make sure that you're telling them which, which, which one. <coughs> well, if, if you tell them with assumed earnings, like most of them, they're not going to understand what that is. But I would, I would still tell them that. But then they're going to go, huh, what's this? They're going to give you a fair market value and continued use. In other words, the business is continued. Yeah. And that's really what they're doing. This is really what the, uh, the ASA got a little crazy and they, they, they pinned it down low. This is technically what they're doing. Right. They just don't know that's what they're doing. Do Unless the they think about it. <coughs> Hmm? Did they actually define it? Or yeah, they do. Be? No, it's actually defined. But that assumes you can assign earnings to a specific piece of equipment. Yeah. If it's an airplane, which the ASA seems to like very much, yeah. that's pretty easy. Yeah. You can do it. But if it's, a, if it's a mixing tank inside of a large chemical plant. Well, what they're saying with that is that they're assuming that the, the operations of the, the earnings of the overall chemical plant are sufficient to support the value of still being there and needing and using that equipment. Yeah, it's tough to do. I suspect most of the time what you're really getting is you're getting um, this mar fair market value installed. That's probably what most equipment appraisers are going to do. Because that's really what the data they have. They're going to get the value of the thing. What it would be, they're going to get, most of their data is going to come with fair market value removed. That's where the sales occur. And then they're going to figure out what it costs to, to, to put it back in place. But the, but the 
problem there is if you're doing, if you're looking at comps, mm -hmm. and you say you have a tank in a chemical plant, you want to know what that's worth. And you go to an auction, or you go to a, a website, and okay, here's the same 10,000 gallon stainless steel tank for sale for $10,000, yep. $20,000. That's not the value of that tank in the plant. No, it's not. That's not. But often you see that you, it's done that way, and that's yeah. the value that's, that's applied to it. Yeah. So that needs to be addressed. So you need to make sure that you've explained and you're hiring somebody that knows what they're doing to get what you want and what you need. Well, we do fair market value all the time. Yeah. Fair market value mm -hmm. is selling. Yeah. Case, but then it really, what you're doing all the time is fair market value. It's really fair market value removed. No. Because well, removed includes all your removal costs. Okay. Is it fair market value installed? No, because you're not including all your installation costs. So okay. Instance, yeah. Like you're talking about, I mean, the pads and Right. Yeah. The catch pieces and, and, and the labor. You know, shipping and labor and the fact that they had to tear down half the yeah. building to get to it. To get it out. And yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. that stuff. No, fair market value is we're assuming all of those things are ignored. Yeah. What's it worth on the market? Share? Yeah. But where is it sitting? In other words, where is the equipment? Uh, it's sitting in somebody's. And sometimes fair market value is. only really references, again, as I was talking to you yeah. about the negative value yeah. piece, yep. it is if this company were able to sell in a normal setting, mm -hmm. what is it worth to that next company? See, I, I hope you're getting the idea that this is not clear cut, easy D. I mean, you got to define and try and understand even the best you do, you're still going to have some issues that you're going to have to deal with. It should make you feel really warm and fuzzy and comfortable when you issue your report when you're all done, right? In other words, what I'm trying to point out here, it's not crystal clear. <coughs> this is not a black and white where you can draw the line and say it's right here and here. It's fuzzy. So, real quick, this yeah. is making me crazy. Good. It should. Uh, and that is, so as far as, um, like I've got a small manufacturing coming up in another, another uh, uh, truck repair business. Uh -huh. So, I sort of want to know what I'm doing. This would be helpful. Um, uh, and that is, so if I'm going to hire, say, a CMEA, uh, how, do, how, do I, how do I make sure that I cover my backside and, and, I, and I represent the ownership, <coughs> excuse me, to assume, you know, you're almost making an assumption that they're, they're, they're going to turn around fair market value, continued use with earnings. Yeah, how what do, I would how tell do I know? How do I know okay. that, that that data appraiser is on the same page with what you're going to do is you're going to tell them you want fair market value and continued use because you're going to do the assumed earnings. Oh, okay. You are responsible. Okay, that's as that's you're going to be doing the premise yeah. of value. Is it liquidation mm -hmm. or is it ongoing concern? Yeah. And you should have done the pre-screened. You're going to know and you're going to tell the appraiser, I mean the machine equipment appraiser, you're going to tell them I either want fair market value and continued use or I want fair market value removed because it's either going to be liquidated or it's going to be an ongoing thing. And, and you decide that. And I'll tell you another thing. That yeah. It's fantastically important is to have that conversation of the end use of the report. Yeah. Because that can shift you know what we suggest or what oh, we yeah. you know, there's many times that I'll put three values on there that you mm -hmm. can play with. Yeah. And you know, you can have fair market value, you can have orderly and forced if you want. And yeah. it's it's a matter of just make sure you really communicate, all right, we're going through a divorce environment here, we're working with a husband, we're trying to go in with a Exactly. You know, they need to know why you need it what you're doing and what the purpose is and they can help guide it. Now, in my case, I have an advantage because I do all three of the appraisals. But isn't that a conflict of interest? No. In fact, it eliminates a lot of conflicts and problems. Because and you also have to certify to a code of ethics. That's right, with each, each one. Of your and the attorneys love it because if I screw up or if, if somebody screws up, they know who to blame. <laughs> you know? There's no finger pointing. That's it. <laughs> yeah, John. There's an old adage that says if you're totally comfortable with your appraisal, you probably don't know what you're doing. That's really it. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes it is uh, close your eyes and press send. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Nathan. <laughs> okay, and here's another thing we need to talk about a little bit. The premise of value in the equipment stuff, it can be removal for similar use, Removal for an alternative use or value in place. 
you need to tell them yeah. which one you're using. Hope that made you feel good, huh? Huh? 20 minutes, yeah. I got my watch. Huh? Yeah, okay, yeah. It's, it's, you can have it for removal for similar use, an alternate use, or value in place. Okay, we better move along or we're going to run out of time. Highest and best use things, we've talked a little bit about this. It's not just a real estate concept. We mentioned use path requires you consider liquidation of the entity, this is for BV people, as the highest and best use. I don't know if you do that, but it requires it. That's use path. If you're complying with use path, you have considered whether you are going to liquidate it or not. And we've talked about these kind of examples. The idea of the, you know, the, the company could be worth a, you know, a lot more, the real estate that's owned could be worth a lot more, and so forth. Anyway, we need to move on. All right, now we've got some interesting problems to talk about. What do you do in these kind of things? How many of you do uh, BV assignments for like uh, a state and gift, where you're doing most of this, right? What do you do here now? You're given a two-year-old uh, appraisal done for a refinance, and as <coughs> you're now asked to do a current value for this company that owns this thing. What do you do? Do an update. You demand they do an update? You ask, and they say no, and you not yeah. to explain. If they say no, I disclose the appraisal is two years old. It's, yeah, the real estate is two years old. Could you uh, mark it up and say, hey, the appreciation has been so much in this time, and I'm going to say it's probably worth this now? If you have do that, you have done a oh, real estate appraisal. So if you're licensed for real estate appraisal and, and do the thing, you could do that. Otherwise, you're asking for it. You can do a broker's price opinion in some states. Yeah, some states allow you to do a broker's price if you happen to be a real estate broker. You could do that. In Idaho, a real estate broker's uh, opinion is, would, would, is legal, and they can do that. So, Bill, you've done that. You've got this two-year-old thing in there, and you disclose that. Does that. Are you okay with that? I'm not that. I'm, I, yes, I am okay with that. After yeah. mulling it over for a long time. I am, I, too. I, I, I mean, and I've done that. And I've done that kind of thing. The best information. Particularly where it's, it's, a, it's a deal like where they're doing, they've got a holding company, and they've got, you know, 150 different real estate properties. Yeah. Well, and okay. they want to give... 1% to, to Susie aunt, or, or grandkid. Yeah. But don't you have to always balance it off of what it is? I mean, if you yeah. were telling me that and it was a Barnes and Noble, I'd laugh you out of the corporate. Yeah. Well, it does. Right. And it depends yeah. what, it's, what it's for. In this case, most of the reason this is going to come up, Nathan, it's going to be somebody's doing a, a family limited partnership and they're, they're gifting, they're transitioning this, the, the ownership of this entity, which may own 30 or 40 different properties. Okay and they're doing it to the kids or the grandkids. And the IRS is going to take a look at it and give it a sniff and say, well, we hate these things anyway. The discount, and you're going to throw like a, you're going to have a, maybe a 15% discount for lack of control and a 25 or 30% discount for lack of marketability. And you've got on top of that all this kind of stuff. And so the value, if this underlying property is $100,000 two years ago, it's $105,000 or $110,000 now, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It's not material. We don't care. Now, if the, the entity owns one piece of property, and like you said, it's a, bar, it's a major shopping center or something like that, I'm going to tell them, we're going to appraise that real estate again now, as of this current date, or I ain't doing it. Or you just give an evaluation date of the date. Or, yeah, or two years ago, you could do that, yeah. But that's not going to help them. They need it now. No, right. And so they, they're going to have to get it appraised. And, and I've done a bunch of these where they've got the 30 or 40 or 50 properties in there. And say sorry, it's material. They need to be appraised. So you, as the appraiser, have to. You're, that's your call. And if you do the two-year-old appraisal, are you taking a risk? Not really. I mean, you, I don't think you have any appraiser liability there because you've disclosed what you've done. All right. We've talked about this one a little bit. You need the market rent for a property owned by the rated party, at least the business. We've sort of beat that one to death, I think. Huh? Yeah. I just, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add something. Yeah. There's a comment to that. There's a company out there called Cornerstone. Mm -hmm. They now have 85% of the market of community bank appraisal departments and hmm. 
lending department for you. I have found that I can call my community bank yeah. or whomever who has cornerstone and he'll give me the actual sheets of what those values are spread. Uh -huh. And then I can quote him and use that evidence. And okay. I mean, they've really developed software that is updated quite very often. Okay. If you're comfortable with that, that's fine. We've talked a little, bit, a little bit about this one here, but this is another one I want to expand on a little bit. Here we've got our, our, that food processing facility that's, the real estate's kind of a hodgepodge and, and the machine equipment's just sort of, part of it's part of the real property, part of it's inside, and, and then we're doing the BV thing. And uh, you've been hired to do this thing. And the attorney's also got this real property appraiser and a machine equipment appraiser. How do you deal with this? Who's in charge? Yeah, maybe. Not it. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, the BV guy is probably going to have to be in charge because his, the, his or her value is going to be the final one that incorporates the others. And the BV appraiser is going to have to make sure that the machinery equipment and real estate appraiser don't cross over or, worse, not include certain assets. In other words, you're going to have to go through and make sure that the real property and the machinery equipment appraiser go through the assets and decide what's personal property and what's real property and they appraise those property and then the real estate guy I mean the B, B, you as the BV guy takes and includes the expenses associated with those in the business value earnings you put in the market rent and the, the real estate guy gives you and the rent or whatever you're doing on the equipment or the value of the equipment and then values of business property. Ron? We had um, not too long ago a real estate appraiser apply a B loan value yeah. and we had to go out and we asked them to pull it back out because <laughs> uh -huh. it was you know yeah. uh, hand transaction <laughs> yeah Nathan? actually it was money Chris I think he has better hmm? yeah. oh Chris okay oh, yeah. that was working well to know hey, yeah it. you got to know and then you got to also be told what va what standard you're, you're using so that you don't have to do the work twice yeah. and I was gonna say as a I don't know if you agree with me on this Chris but I see as almost a complete default in the scenario that the real estate guy will not take the piece. he will to him it is a cinder block building yep. with nothing in it right and so <coughs> a lot of times we as m and e's have some gray areas we have to look at I mean, let's just say it's like the hood on a restaurant, yeah. you know, or something like that. Um, and a lot of times we end up with it, mm -hmm. but as, a, as the BV who's in charge of that, make sure that there's a clarification for sure. Which we yeah. do is about the gray areas. Yeah. 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 Just say, I know there's some gray areas on this thing. Mm -hmm. You two figure out who's taking the gray area. Yeah, you got to make sure. Report. Tony? <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it's sometimes that simple. Where, when the building is supposed to be able to house it, if you could even find something like that. Most of the time when you get these things, it's been like 15 or 20 years later. If such a thing was done, it isn't around now. And it would be wonderful if you had it, yeah. So when you're in a situation, when you talk about litigation, mm -hmm. it involves the sale of the business. Mm -hmm. So at that point, the, um, the investment bankers, the real estate, the biz bell, we're all kind of working for the owner in that mm -hmm. scenario. Have you ever seen the Isval uh, leadership responsibility go to somebody else? Oh, yeah. Particularly if you get into shareholder disputes. Right. And those kind of things. I've done a number of those where you're essentially well, looking for the talking. or you're looking for the oppressed share oppressed shareholder. Those are really interesting transactions. I've done a number of those and they're kind of fun. If those of you that may not know what that is, in other words, that's where uh, a, a, a company, somebody may own like say 10% of the company, and they're just getting screwed royally. The hundred, or the the major majority owners taking all the money, is taking all the earnings, is taking, is getting bigger and bigger salaries and all that kind of things, and giving this minority nothing. At some point, they get so fed up, they file a lawsuit, and they go in and sue as a oppressed shareholder. 
What that is is basically saying, okay, you're going to have to buy me out as if I were a pro rata owner of the whole. And then you go through and you take all that money that the control thing and you put it back to what it should have been if it were being operated on an arm's length arrangement kind of thing. In other words, the owner can now take a reasonable market salary and the rest of it drops down to earnings. You figure out what it really should be and then he's going to buy out the press shareholder or something on that fund. That's a parada of the earnings. Yeah. And those are lots of fun to do. I've done a number of them. And uh, yeah, I bet, Ron, you've done some of those too. Yeah. And those are, those are kind of exciting deals to do. All right, I think we've got now down. To, we've got a few minutes left. Any other questions that, uh, or things that I skimmed over that you want uh, further elaboration on? Is there any information on this thing? Yeah, all his stuff's on, this, on the cloud or on your He's including the contacts. Yeah. Including that very important sheet. Ask as many questions as you Yeah, so if, you have, if you'd like to have some of those kind of things that, uh, you know, that I've talked about, I'd be happy to send them to you. I'm perfectly willing to share. So anyway, in wrapping up, then, if there's no other questions, I probably either bored you to death or you're so overwhelmed with questions that you have no idea which way is up. Um, the concept I really wanted to get across here was the three disciplines, you know, the, the real estate, machine equipment, BV, all look at things differently. They all have different approaches. It's the same overall, you know, concepts apply. You know, there, there's a market approach, there's a cost approach, an income approach, but they all look at them differently. They use them differently. They all have different data, widely different things. But the main thing to understand is the standards of value and the premises of value, they look at them differently. And you, as a BV guy, if you're doing something you need their work, you need to make sure that they understand exactly what it is that you need. Be crystal clear. And then when you get the report from them, look at it to see if they did what they were supposed to do. Okay? Yep. How often do you run into appraisers that are certified in all areas? Not too often. As far as the, there's one guy in the country that has an ASA in all three. Me. Oh, Nobody else was stupid enough to do it. Well, the other yeah. thing is, I think there's a massive personality difference even between the three entities. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that means you're a sociopath, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would tend to agree. <laughs> split personality disorder, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, the way, behind. just the way you view the world is a, an <laughs> It is. And just even, I mean, you can even see it in the dress styles and in the interaction with other people. I mean, the, yeah. the M&E guys, for the most part, you guys will work with, will probably be more blue collar, more layman environment. And just yeah. keep that in mind, that your mindset, you know. That's yeah, it's a different world. We do all three. Did you know Jack Emery? I know the name, I don't know. Yeah, he's passed. Oh, he's in about five, six years ago. I, I believe he was also all three. Is it? Probably back in yeah. Was it? Yeah. I asked the ASA to look it up for me, and they told me I was the only one. Um, there's a couple others. That are, that there's a few people around that just I think have that are probably there's a. I know there's some MA, MAIs that are also uh, machinery equipment guys. Yeah. There's quite a few of those. Right. I don't know if there's any very many. B, and there's some B, other BV guys that I think that are real estate. BV and MAs. Yeah. But there's not too many that do all three. But uh, see, the, I got into it that way because I, I chose to live in a small market where basically I couldn't make it as a 100% time as a BV guy, there's just not enough business. Um, I mean, I live in a, actually I live between two small cities. You know, right out in the middle of Bureau, Bureau land management ground and I raise Shetland ponies. And I choose to live in an area where there just isn't that much business, and so I have to do more than just BV. And I happen to like doing all three. It's a, kind of a hoot. So. That's important. Yep, I think it's fun. All right. Well, thanks very much. Well, uh